week eight, Luke's gospel, where he portrays Jesus as a savior for all, not just chosen few, not just the ones who perceive themselves as godly. And we come to a point where he's really focusing on what righteousness is. Now, we could define righteousness simply as the way of life that pleases the Lord. And of course, Jesus clashes with the religious authorities in um, his time uh, when it comes to describing what that way of life entails. And that is because God's values are so vastly different from ours that in order to please him, we must abandon everything we esteem in order to embrace what he treasures. So we start in chapter 14, verse 1, looking at things that righteousness will cost us. And the first thing that dawned on me was it costs us easy answers, which is another way of describing legalism. Because we have here, on a Sabbath, Jesus dining at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. And of course, uh, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? In other words, which pleases God more? To heal or to refrain from helping? And they remain silent. They're not about to answer that question. They're not about to commit themselves. They are there to see him incriminate himself. And it dawned on me, where did this man come from? He wasn't one of the dinner guests because it says that Jesus took and healed him and then sent him away. And it dawned on me that they had brought that man in as a test for Jesus. And having healed him, he asks them another question. This is not, you know, what's lawful. This is what would you do? He says, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Now, we get occasional news articles about people having fallen into uh, wells or uh, mine shafts or things like that. It's very important to get them out quickly, particularly the wells of that time. You fall down there, there's nothing to climb out with, and you could drown. It is a life or death situation. And if you don't know what dropsy is, you don't quite get the full impact of this question. Because it's, a, it's an old term, right, for a form of edema that indicates, usually, major organ failure. The man was dying. Is it lawful to heal, to help, to save life on the Sabbath? Does it please God? Now, we have something of an advantage from our perspective because we know who Jesus is. He did it. Therefore, we know that is what pleases God. But we're so much drawn to the setting of non-negotiable lines about what is and what isn't allowed, whether it's on the Sabbath or in any other kind of uh, moral situation. And that's what they had done. They had drawn lines beyond the guidance provided by the law. Doing that, right, not only eliminates the need to think about these questions, what is it that actually pleases God, but it sets them up as the authorities to tell other people 
don't think about this. This is what you need to do. That's what legalism does. And a life of righteousness costs us this ability to just set an easy answer. We have to always be asking, is this something that will please God? Is this something he rejects? Another thing right, that, that righteousness, true righteousness costs us is pride. Now, you know, pride is a big word. Uh, currently, it has been for some time. But listen to the story that Jesus tells. When he notices how the people at the dinner chose places of honor to sit in, right? We just kind of pile around a table. We don't really care much who sits where. But in his day, there was a hierarchy at the table. The host was at the highest place. His chosen, his honored guests sat at either side of him and so forth down the table until you had the most junior, the lowest seniority, the least honored. So he tells this story. When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor. Lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I don't think that Jesus is necessarily concerned with um, social maneuvering, shall we say. I don't really think what concerns him here is what to do, the etiquette of a party. When he talks about a wedding feast, what do you think he's talking about? Quite often, in fact, dare to say most of the time, he's talking about the kingdom of God. When God's kingdom comes in its fullness, it will be like a wedding feast. And there will be many who believe themselves deserving of a seat of honor at God's table, who will either be uh, pushed to lower places in favor of others, or they will be shut out altogether. And we'll come to that in a little bit. But what is it in this kind of situation that pleases God? What is the true life of righteousness? It's encapsulated in the verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Righteousness costs you your pride. But there's this implication, right? When you lay aside your pride, what will God do? have to try and see. <laughs> There's another thing that righteousness will cost, and that is in the Latin phrase quid pro quo, the giving in order to get. Jesus also says to the man who had invited him, okay, so this is the man who's throwing the party. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. See, 
doing good only to those who will do good to you in return is not righteousness. This is not reflective of God's method, which is to do good to the wicked and be ungrateful. Now, I've known people who will, in so many words, say, I'm never doing anything good for that person again because, well, whether it's they didn't thank me for it or they offended me in some way, that is not the life of righteousness. Righteousness follows God's method. And what has he done? He gives the sun and the rain for not only the just, but for the unjust. And when we were still his enemies, he gave us the life of his son that we might live. And righteousness can't be motivated by temporal reward. You know, you see in other places in, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus talking about how those who do righteousness to be seen by others and praised by them have received the only reward they're going to get. Well, in this case, those who do good things in order to receive good things from others, they've received their reward. They're not getting anything more. But those who do good to people who can't repay them, people who won't repay them, those are the ones who will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And of course, this is a really touchy conversation. So if somebody at the table decides to throw out a, shall we say, a calming phrase, something that everybody could agree to. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. <laughs> and you could almost hear the rest of the assembly murmuring oh yes yes that's so true amen but jesus he tells another story <clears throat> a man once gave a great banquet and invited many and at the time for the banquet he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited come for everything is now ready but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, well, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I must go to examine them. Please have me excused. <laughs> and another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. If you're familiar with this parable, you'll know right from this point here, that uh, true righteousness is going to cost us our excuses. Because what happens to all of these who, though invited, have decided that they have better things to do, that they have higher priorities than to come to the banquet? The condemning phrase comes in verse 24. I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Who does get to come? The poor, crippled, blind, lame, and the outsiders. In fact, right, brought in everyone in the first instance, those who cannot repay. And there's still room. So the master says, right, go out into the highways and hedges and just find whoever you find. Now, if you go out to the highways and the hedges, there's a fairly good chance that you're going to shake out some pretty nasty people. And why do you think we have the word highwayman from, you know, back in the day when bandits <laughs> roamed the highways? Uh, you know, this is an indiscriminate. Go and find people. I don't care who they are. Bring them in. And so much for the worthy ones. Who had better things to do? You see, a life of righteousness 
never puts personal business before kingdom business, which is easy to say, but really hard to do because, right? There are things we want to do, things we enjoy doing, and things that are in themselves not bad. They might actually be quite good things, but they aren't kingdom things. And we need to be ready at any time to change plans, to set those aside in order to do what God wants us to do. That's a, that is a difficult way to live. Because you think about it, um, investments. You know, there's I bought a field, I bought five yoke of oxen. These are investments in one's property. And everybody will tell you right, that you need to invest for the future, whether that's retirement or your children's college or what have you. But these things can never get in the way of God saying things like when you give a dinner or a banquet, don't give it for your own pleasure. With people you know and enjoy and who will pay you back. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. That's a hard thing. That's the life of righteousness. In fact, all other priorities, apart from genuine discipleship, will have to go by the wayside if they get in the way of true righteousness, right? We move from this dinner scene to when Jesus is out in the crowds and he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. And he tells a couple of micro parables, right? One about building, right? If any of you have ever built your own home or been involved in a building project, you know how much planning goes before even the ground is broken for the building. Because of course, if you don't have enough resources, you're going to end up with a partial building and a lot of mockery. <laughs> it will be a, a monument to poor planning, if nothing else. Uh, or there's a micro parable about going to war. Does not a king who goes out to war with another king sit down first and figure out, huh, do I stand a chance with the number of men I have compared to the number of men I know he has? Because you know, if you go out and you don't have the resources, you're going to get slaughtered. In those uh, days, quite literally slaughtered. So if you know you can't do it, you <laughs> go out and you send somebody under the flag of truce and you make terms. And he says, it's the same thing. If you want to be my disciple, you need to think first, are you willing to give what it costs to be a disciple? I don't know if we emphasize that enough. When we bring people to the point of baptism, have we talked with them about what it costs to belong to Jesus? Have we modeled, <laughs> that's the harder thing, have we modeled what it means to belong to Jesus? Have they seen it in our lives? But it's not all about giving up. It's not all about the things you need to put aside to surrender. Because there's that other part of it. We put aside what we value in order to seek out what God treasures. And chapter 15 is entirely about what God treasures. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. I want you 
to figure that out for yourself. It begins with Jesus being surrounded by some very, should we say, questionable characters, tax collectors and the like. And of course, certain of the onlookers, Pharisees and scribes, are grumbling because this man receives sinners and eats with them. Oh, it's terrible. So Jesus, Jesus tells them a parable, right? What man of you having a hundred sheep if he has lost one? Now, normally we think 99% is quite an excellent score. Mind you, uh, when, it, when it's, from when I worked at the high school, uh, there was a running joke that, you know, 99% is a great score academically, but try coming back with 99% of the students you took on a field trip. <laughs> It's not going to be a happy day. And he's like, you know what? You got sheep. 99% of them are in the fold. One is missing. Don't you go out looking for it? And when you find it, you're better pleased with that one sheep than with the rest of them that just stay quietly. One might even say obediently in the fold. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, of course, we don't get into the topic in this parable about, are there actually any righteous persons? <laughs> but, um, you know, we'll, we'll leave that uh, for thinking about later. And, of course, second parable. See if you notice a pattern here. What woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, doesn't light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I think you're getting the point now, aren't you? What is it that God treasures? He treasures finding the lost. And the remainder of the chapter is dedicated to the story, a moving story, actually, of a lost son. Now, a sheep is one thing. A coin, that's something. But a son, your own child, that puts a different spin on it. Of course, I don't need to read you the whole story. There's a man who has two sons and the younger son gets ahead of himself and says, you know what? I want the inheritance that you would give me when you're dead. <laughs> nice, just what every parent wants to hear from their child. And then of course, as soon as he gives it over, what does the boy do? He travels. He leaves home. Not only does he leave home, but he is quite, quite foolish in how he decides to spend his inheritance. It's called reckless living. We get a different view of it when we talk to the older brother later in the story, but he blows it all on his pleasures. And then hard times come on him and he has nothing. In fact, he's brought so low that he is hired to feed the pigs of a Gentile farmer. You don't get much lower than that in Jewish culture. And he was so hungry that he would have even eaten the pig food but nobody gave him anything. And that scene where he comes to himself, where he's sitting there and he's like, really? In my father's house, the servants are better off than I am. So 
I have to go home. But I can't go home as a son. I've totally cut, I've burned that bridge. I've cut myself off in every possible way. So maybe if I go and say, could you hire me as a servant? Maybe then I'll find a place. So he goes home. You can almost hear him like rehearsing his speech as he goes along, as he gets closer and closer to his father's house. But while he was still a long way off, what happens? The father saw him and ran. Uh, a dignified Jewish man does not run. <laughs> but this man ran and he embraces him. He kisses his forehead. He is just so pleased, so relieved, so overjoyed to have this boy back safe that the kid doesn't get through half his speech before the father just like, never mind. All right, bring him the best robe, clean him up, doll him up. We're having a party because he's home. That's so it's like this, this lost son is almost like carried into the house. He's like, he's a, this wave of people carry him away to take care of him, to feed him, and to celebrate. He's not sneaking in through the back door. He's not even putting in his job application. He's coming home as a son, as a treasured son no less, right? They killed the fattened calf. That means they prepared the very best for him. And of course, right, story's not quite complete with this happy ending because there's another son, the one that we sort of lost track of from the beginning, the obedient one, the one who stayed put, the heir, in fact. He comes in, he finds all this party music and dancing and all this going on. He's like, what is happening here? And the servants tell him, you know, your brother's come and your father has just spared no expense to celebrate his return. And he gets angry. Because, you know, when you've done your best to do what's right all this time and you find out that somebody who has been just horrible is being celebrated for coming back and saying, I'm sorry, I was horrible and hasn't even done anything yet. He hasn't proven himself. It, yeah, it is very easy to get angry. Like what has all my hard work been for? What has my obedience been for? I don't even know anymore. So the father comes out to try to persuade him. And he's quite sassy to his father. <laughs> and you know what? All these years I've served you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never even gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours, and here's where we get another view on what the son had been doing, who devoured your property with prostitutes. Trust a sibling to you know, not mince words. You killed a fattened calf for him? And here's where we get probably the closest view into what God values. When the father says to this older son, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It's fitting. It's right to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. to bring the dead back to life, to bring the lost safely home. That is at the heart of God's righteousness. Next week, we turn to chapters 16 and a bit of chapter 17, talking about you might say kingdom values. We found out that God really, really, really treasures finding the lost. 
what do we do when that clashes with our idea of treasure? Well, join us next week. Find out. <laughs>